everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to the PRISM eSymposium. My name is Erica Clefane and I will be serving as moderator for this session. I'd like to introduce my co-moderator, Jonathan Gibson. Hello. You are in the Forensic Science concurrent session. This session will go on from 5.35 p.m. to 6 p.m. In this session, we will hear from students presenting on topics related to forensic science. Audience, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A button below to write them and send them in. We will select questions at the end of each presentation. Next slide, please. Our first presenter is Yvonne Sandoval, and the title of the presentation is Examining the Effects of Density on Blowfly Larval Development. Take it away, Yvonne. Thanks, Erica, and hello, everyone. Forensic investigation, um, I'm sorry, next slide. Forensic investigations of crime scenes utilize many tools as evidence, such as insects. Forensic entomologists study insects and other arthropods, like blowflies. It is imperative to understand blowfly uh, behavior, life cycle, and larval development. You can see the stages in the images below. Working backwards, an analyst determines the minimum time of colonization, or MTC, as the time eggs are laid. This is used as evidence to suggest an estimated time of death, the postmortem interval, or PMI. Next slide, please. Biotic and abiotic factors, like resource competition and nutrition, can influence the growth of larvae. Larval length is relative to the nutrients it consumes. Adult fly is a proxy for larval size. Since, resources uh, since resource competition affects larval size, which reflects adult fly size, this can throw off the MTC and neg negatively impact the PMI in a criminal investigation. Next slide. This is my hypothesis. It seems likely if larvae experience species-dependent resource competition, they will be smaller, and as a result, adults will be smaller too. Um, next slide. To test this hypothesis, eggs were collected from established uh, research colonies and allowed to hatch for species Lucilia sericata and Califera vicina. Next, larvae were placed on the same amount of pork of raw pork liver for each treatment jar, and then were placed on the same. Oh, I'm sorry, and then were placed in a treatment jar and contained a different level of density. This was repeated five times. These three jars were control. Uh, with 50 larvae that had plenty of nutrients, the 100 larvae and the high density with 300 larvae. Once all jars were sealed, larvae were left to complete their development into adult. Finally, adult flies were counted, sexed, and measured based on proxy fitness measurements because the size of adults reflects the size of larvae. Next slide. Here we have three graphs demonstrating the effective density on fitness measurements for vicina. From left to right, they are length of wing and length of thorax and length of tibia. The results obtained for both sexes reflected a significant effect due to density on all three variables. Both females and males significantly affected in high density treatments. Conversely, there is no difference in low and medium treatments. Next slide. For Saracata, the graphs of the results are in the same layout. They were significant effects due to treatment on females on the left, but not on males on the right. As the density increased, their size decreased, hence exhibiting completely different sex responses when compared to those of Vicina. Uh, next slide. The result from this exper experiment demonstrate that there are density dependent effects on larval development, and there is a significant difference between species on the effect of adult fly size. However, there are species-specific and spe sex-specific responses. For example, vicina resulted in both sexes affected by high density. High density. Conversely, this species experienced optimal develop development in the low and medium density treatments. Overall, there were few differences between the medium and control treatments. A big difference when compared to Saracata's sex-specific responses where females were most affected, showing the importance of the role she plays in the colonization. Bigger fly equals more eggs equals reproducibility. Larval size is important in forensic entomology because it is a proxy for adult size. 
Results from this work will further the understanding of the role of density dependent effects on larval development and size. This will ultimately improve information for PMI estimations. Next slide. Currently, I am in the process of quantifying mortality data of the larvae. This will show if density affects overall mortality. Next, I would like to examine more species since the crime scene involves multiple species competing uh, for resources. One can also examine species dependent effects in an environment with species combination reflecting a real, wor real world scenario where they compete for um, multiple species compete for the same resources. Next slide. Thank you all for listening. I owe special thanks to PRISM staff, Dr. Jennifer Rosati, my daughter, my partner, and my sister for patience and support throughout my research work. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, we have a following question from an audience member. Uh, can you please clarify what are the density treatments? Sure, yeah, the density treatments are um, where I have the same amount of raw pork liver and I am simulating an environment um, where I can change the amount of larvae to, um, to the desired competition amount that I want. For example, control was no competition. Medium was a little bit less food and uh, the 300 was really to set in, uh, push the competition. Thank you. And we have a second quick question. Uh, what okay. are the density levels would you like to evaluate? Um, I'd like to fill in the gap between the 100 and the 300. I think I would add two additional treatments between those two. Great, thank you for that. Uh, next slide, please. Our next presenter is Liana Elbano. And the title of the presentation is Analysis of Polymer-Coded Bullets Using Spectroscopic Methods. Take it away, Liana. Thank you and good evening. Today I will talk to you about polymer-coded bullets. I will discuss my hypothesis and research approach. I took to identify the composition of the polymer-coded bullets. I will also discuss my results, conclusions, and next steps. Next slide. Polymer-coded bullets have a synthetic jacket. The synthetic jacket reduces the wear on the bore of the gun, as well as prevents metal-on-metal -metal contact between the bullet and the bore. Additionally, polymer-coated bullets do not contain a lubrication groove. The absence of a lubrication groove prevents lead from sticking to the bore of a gun. So red. <laughs> Originally, federal ammunition- I was so nervous. <laughs> ...bullets with encased in nylon. These nylon-coated bullets went by the name NICLAD. Since then, these coated bullets have been discontinued by Federal. A new line of ammunition released by Federal employs a synthetic jacket, which encases the lead core in a polymer. It is important to determine the composition of the polymer, as it can lead to knowing if the polymer contains harmful substances. Next slide. Methods such as infrared spectroscopy and Raman spectroscopy can be used to determine the composition of the polymers. These two methods will provide insight into both the IR active and Raman active bonds present in the polymers. Next slide. First, the melting point and solubility of the polymers were determined. To determine the melting point, a piece of each polymer was shaved off and with the use of a hot stage attached to a microscope, the melting point was determined. Similarly, to determine the solubility, once again, a piece of each polymer was shaved off and placed into various solvents. Then, each polymer was analyzed using IR spectroscopy. Unfortunately, due to recent circumstances, the polymers cannot be analyzed using Raman spectroscopy. Next slide. On the left is a table showing the solvents in which the red polymer was soluble and insoluble in. And on the right is a table showing the solvents in which the blue polymer was soluble in and insoluble in. In the middle is a blue polymer before and after the melting point analysis. The melting point of the blue polymer was determined to be between 83 and 86 degrees Celsius. The melting point of the red polymer was determined to be between 373 and 388 degrees Celsius. Next slide. Using IR, the unknown polymers were able to be compared to known polymers. 
On the left is the IR spectrum of the blue polymer overlaid with a top library match. The red line indicates the blue bullet, while the blue line indicates a known polymer. On the right is the IR spectrum of the red polymer overlaid with a top library match. The red line indicates the red bullet, while the blue line indicates a known polymer. Next slide. IR spectroscopy revealed that the blue bullet has similar functional groups to dimethyl isothalate, while the red polymer has similar functional groups to polyethylene glycol terephthalate. Next slide. Using IR, we have an idea of the composition of the polymers. Next, Raman spectroscopy will be used to either further identify the polymer or confirm the IR results. Additionally, since these types of polymer coated bullets do not retain individualizing minutiae like standard bullets do, it will be determined if traces of the polymer can be detected on impact marks. Next slide. Lastly, Dr. Diachuk and myself would like to thank PRISM as well as Dr. Refner for allowing us to use this instrumentation to further our research. Thank you. Thank you, Liana. Uh, we have a question from one of our audience members. Uh, can you please clarify what is Raman spectroscopy? So Raman spectroscopy, similar to IR spectroscopy, is um, shining um, a light onto a sample and seeing how much um, electromagnetic radiation bounces off of that sample. So some bonds are only present when you use um, IR and some are only present when you use Raman. So those two can be used complementary to determine in general the bonds that are present within the polymer and help identify what those functional groups are. Great, thank you. And we have another uh, question from the audience. Uh, do you know if the polymers you've identified have been used to coat bullets in the past? So, um, like I mentioned, um, NICLADs, which are nylon coated bullets, they began to surface in the 1980s and they were made to reduce airborne lead in shooting ranges as well as prevent lead fouling in the barrel of a gun. Um, this particular ammunition, however, never became popular and other manufacturers started to produce uh, polymer coated bullets. Then in 2016, the federal, federal Ammunition Company returned to coating bullets with polymers and they officially added these polymer coated bullets to their line of Syntec ammunition. Great, thank you so much, Liana. Audience members, please remember if you have any questions for our presenters, you can use the Q&A button below and send them in. Next slide, please. Our last presenter is Hilary Menes, and the title of the presentation is Structure from Motion, 3D rendering of bone traumas and pathologies. Take it away, Hillary. Thank you, Erica. Next slide, please. Hey, everyone. Today I'm going to talk to you about what Structure for Motion is and how it can relate to forensic science. Structure for Motion is a focus of this research project and is a technique we use in order to reconstruct 3D bone fragments from still images. We will go into the background hypothesis and a result of this project. So structure for motion, oh, no, sorry. Okay, so structure for motion is a process of creating 3D objects using a series of 2D images that overlap with one another and are required from multiple viewpoints. Multiple views of the object are captured with camera in a range of various positions as seen in the figure. Common feature points are identified among the image set in order to establish a spatial relationship between the original image locations into a 3D coordinate system. And so this technique produces a dense point cloud-based model, which is intensified using multi-view stereo. Next. So why structure for motion? Um, so the structure for motion technique offers a possibility of fast, automated, and low-cost acquisition of 3D data. Next. Specific features will be captured for future analysis. We want to create a cloud-based 3D model, model rendering pipeline to analyze pathology and morphometrics of human skeletal remains from a tomb complex in Luxor, Egypt. And so these pictures are captured of mummified and skeletonized human remains contain bones that were damaged during the person's lifetime. And so ultimately the creation of the software will help speed up the process of bone analysis. Next. So, 
Structure for motion services vary in their characteristics and options. There is software that changes the resolution of the images in order to speed up computations, which may limit the position of generated data. The availability of data used to describe the camera will also vary from software to software, which can limit the assessment of internal geometry. And so acquiring images with the right characteristics is very, very important. The best one that we use for this particular project is Colmap and MeshLab used sequentially. Colmap is a general purpose structure for motion and MVS pipeline with a command line interface. And then MeshLab was used to visualize the 3D objects. An important thing to know regarding the use of Colmap is that we needed a powerful computer to run the program. If it didn't have a high enough capacity, it would exit ungracefully. And so as you can see, these are the photosats that we use to construct a 3D rendering. A smartphone camera, the iPhone SE camera, we use to take photos of each sample on the left. And then a professional camera, a Nikon D7200 DSL camera, we used to take the photo set on the right. And two different types of cameras were used to compare quality of rendering. Next. And so this object was able to be rendered with Colmap and visualized with MeshLab. For the most part, specific features were able to be extracted, although part of the background was also picked up by the software. Um, one possible way that this could be fixed is by deleting those specific cloud points. It would have to be individually though. And so this object was rendered using the photo set taken from the iPhone SE camera. Next. So in the near future, we plan to work with MongoDB, which is a document-based database management tool that will serve as a database for our photo collections and 3D objects. Next. So I would like to thank Dr. Corsals and PRISM for this opportunity, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much, Hillary. Uh, we have a question for one of our audience members. Uh, can you please explain more of what feature extraction is? Yes. Okay, so feature, de feature extraction and feature detection actually go in hand, hand in hand. So feature detection finds sparse feature points in the image and describes their appearance using a numerical descriptor and then Colmap imports images and performs both feature detection and extraction in one step. Great, thank you. And we have a second question. Um, can you please explain what MVS is? So MVS is multi-view stereo. It's used by the program and it takes the output of structure for, from this specific program to determine depth and information for every pixel in an image. Great, thank you. And we have one last question. Uh, why did you use two cameras in your experiment? So that was just to compare um, how the rendering would turn out. So you would have noticed that I didn't use the 3D object that was rendered from the professional camera because it didn't do a complete rendering. Got it. Thank you so much for that clarification. Of course. Uh, with that, we would like to conclude our session. I would like to thank our presenters for all of their hard work and ask everyone in the audience to send them a big round of applause. Uh, we will now begin with our next plenary session in which our keynote and PRISM alumna, Dr. Olivia Orta, will discuss her career trajectory from John Jay College to Harvard University while sharing lessons learned along the way. To join the plenary, please visit our website, www.jjay.cuny.edu slash PRISM and follow the link at the bottom to join the second plenary session. Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you all are well. Stay safe.